Before I read the scripture, I want to read a little passage from one of my favorite books. It's called Holy Sweat. And he does a chapter on holiness, but, he's, but he spells it W-H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. Meaning that one of the works of God in our lives is to make us whole. You know, the, the idea of salvation for many of us, you know, did you get saved in, in evangelical terminology uh, is in some, at some level an incorrect theological way of looking at salvation because we believe God was at work saving us before we knew that we even needed to be saved and we believed we were justified and we got saved the day we came to the realization we needed him and asked Jesus in our life. But the truth of it is, is that God is still saving us. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's still perfecting us. He's sanctifying us. He's working into our lives those things that we can't have unless we are walking with him. And so here this little quote. Did you know that the word salvation comes from the Latin word salus, the root word, which means wholeness? So the word salvation at its root means an idea of being wholeness. God cares about our intellectual needs, our physical needs, our emotional needs, and our spiritual needs. He is committed to the whole person. We, therefore, the writer says, need to be on a quest to discover and develop our wholeness as well as our holiness. And what I'm going to talk about today for a little bit, for a few minutes, is one of the main ways that we can participate with the work of God in our lives to bring us to a place of wholeness. So the scripture is from the Phillips translation, James chapter 1, the first few verses. It says this, James, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, sends greetings to the 12 dispersed tribes. And here we get down to it. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. I want to make this point. The quality of endurance is important in the life of the believer, and it is something that has to be produced. You don't get it by going through the checkout line an extra couple of times at Walmart, although sometimes checking out at Walmart is an act of endurance. <laughs> you with me? They come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. Now listen to this phrase. But let the process go on, as if to say, don't fight it, don't resist it, don't try to run from it, don't try to make it happen faster. Let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed. There's the wholeness. And then you will find that you've become men of mature character with the right sort of independence. Pray with us. Father, speak to us today. Let your word today not be words written on a page, but spirit spoken into our hearts to give us life, that we might be people who come to this place of wholeness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am drawn to people who have that sense of wholeness. Every once in a while, and we probably all encountered people like this in our journey, every once in a while I encounter someone that encountering them, being around them, engaging in conversation with them, leaves me with a sense of that there's something about their life that I don't yet have. I had a Sunday school teacher one time who became a mentor and a, and a good friend who would get in my face, who would challenge me when he saw me coming a little short of what he knew I needed to be doing. And, 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 and I just, I appreciated that. I had a, a counselor one time that, we, that did our marriage counseling that when I was with him, I, I just knew I was in the presence of the real deal. There, there was no phony baloney. There, it, 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 was, it was somebody who had a sense of well-developed character and wholeness. I, I've had a couple of doctors in my lifetime that I knew when I was talking to that doctor, I knew that they knew exactly what they were doing and that they had thought about it and they had read the chart and they had carefully considered what needed to be done for me or for my wife. And, and I knew in that moment that I was encountering some, you understand what I'm talking about, a level of wholeness, somebody who's fully developed, that, that they know all of what they are. I had some coaches that, that were really coaches. They weren't coaches because they were bored and needed some way to make a living. They were coaches because they were coaches, right? And in their heart, that's what beat. And, 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 and they didn't see it as, you know, who had the most lights lit up on their side of the scoreboard. They saw it as a chance to develop young men and young women and pour into their lives, and, and, and that affected me. And, and the, the trick for all of us is to say this, 
And it takes boldness to say it. God, I want to be a person like that. I want to be the kind of person that when people encounter me, when they engage my life, that they know they are encountering someone who's gone through the process and, and they came out on the other end and they have a sense of wholeness about their lives. This is not plastic Christianity. This is not somebody who knows all the latest catchphrases or the latest books that are out there on the internet. And th this is not somebody who's been to all the workshops and all the seminars and, and they can just kind of pretend and be happy about it. This is somebody who has a substance to their lives that you cannot mistake for anything other than the genuine, real, authentic deal. So, I'm going to tell the story I told last week. For those that weren't here, I'll tell the shorter version. In 1981, I was an eighth grader, and I was on the track team. That in and of itself is kind of interesting, but uh, I was on the track team because all eighth graders that were in sports had to run track. One day we went down, and it happened to be the first spring day that it really got hot. First spring day, when it really gets hot out there on the track, your lungs burn at a different level. Your body hurts at a different level. And on that particular day, because... Our coach, being who he was, decided to run us harder than he had run us all the way until that point. I love coaches for that, sort of. So Coach Armstrong lined us up out on this little dirt track. It was about 300 meters, and here's what he said. He got us in groups of like five or six, and he said, you're going to run until you win a race. So he lined us up. You were in your group. You just sort of random who the group was. And we ran that for a while. We ran for a few of those. And this slow white boy began to make a very brilliant deduction. I'm going to have a hard time with this formula. I'm not ever going to win a race. So I would like to find a way to not continue to run until I vomit or pass out. And so after we came around the corner one of the other times, I was, I was bent over, huffing and puffing like everybody else, trying not to throw up. And, and I looked up at Coach Armstrong and I said, Coach, if I have to run one more lap, I'm going to faint. And he said, son, women faint, men pass out. <laughs> to which I said, coach, if I have to run one more lap, I'm going to pass out. Let me tell you something about endurance. It's a tricky thing. You ever notice that the people that you think are going to endure the best are the ones that drop out first, and the ones that you didn't think would make it two or three laps are the ones that are still running. But it is true that women do faint, and it's true that men pass out. And the scripture tells us in Isaiah 40 that even the youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So how do we get to this place of wholeness? How, how do we learn endurance? How do, we, how do we come through the trials and difficulties of life and, and it not wound us and cripple us, but on the end of it, we come out more whole, more complete, more able to handle the things that come at us in life. How do we do that? Well, James gives us something of a formula here to develop in us that deeply authentic life. But the problem for us is that we have to somehow make a connection between pain and purpose. But here's the truth of it. If you know the Lord, if something's in your life, then he is busy at work in the middle of that, no matter how difficult it is, doing something he can't do when everything's rosy. Are you with me? It's just not going to be that way. It's not, it's not going to be like, I'm going to be a mature person who is capable of helping others in difficult trials by my bills always being paid, me always being healthy, my job's always wonderful, my relationships are great, everything's fantastic and easy. It's not going to happen that way. He's going to allow some things, and James says, when those things come into your life, you should consider it pure joy. You should not resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Aren't you glad you came to church today? But it's true. And, and no matter who we are, and, and no matter where we are in life, I hate to break the news to you, you're either on your way into a trial, on your way out of a trial, or on your way in between a trial. Hello. It's, it's, just, it's the human experience. We live in a fallen world. But in the middle of that, God is at work trying to bring in us something of great value that's precious in his eyes. And so... How do we do that? What, what are the principles? How do, we, how do we come at this with a mindset and a heart that allows us to benefit from it rather than become bitter because of it? Well, first of all, you've got to realize that what James is saying is this requires a mindset. You've got to have a different mindset than people who don't know the Lord. You have to, not in a flimsy way, not in a fake way, say, well, hallelujah, isn't Jesus great? 
bless you, you know. But you have to, even in the midst of t- tough situations, be honest about how you're feeling. But somehow, you have to have an idea that on the end of this, there's something of great value, or otherwise the Lord wouldn't be letting you go through it in the first place. So there's got to be a definitive mindset, and by definitive, I mean it is the thing that defines us. See, what, what is it that defines people? How they act when everything's wonderful, or how they act when they're under pressure? That, that's what defines us. What, when, when we see somebody going through something and it is tearing their heart out and it is absolutely not what you would wish on anyone and you watch that person walk through it, that's when you know that somehow they've got something going on in their lives that has allowed them to adjust their perspective and they're making a connection between pain and purpose. Because here's the trick. The truth of it is, is that part of your purpose is in the pain. But you've got to figure it out. So, what, what, do, what do we see about mindset? Don't resent them as intruders. I know people that can't get a hangnail without freaking out and being mad all day. Are you with me? You know those people. They, you know? You just, we need to start a new church. We could probably fill it in town. We could call it the Church of the Wimpy Christian. All wimpy Christians should go here. We're never going to say anything hard. It's always going to be simple and easy. We're always just going to tell jokes and tell you that everything's going to work out great. Go home. There are churches like that, by the way, and there are pastors that preach that sort of stuff, by the way. But I don't think it's biblical, and I don't think you have to go very far other than the life of Jesus to know that that's not true. So welcome them as friends. Are you out of your mind? Welcome them as friends. That takes a perspective that you need the Holy Spirit to help with you. But realize, he says, there's a realization here, that they come to produce in you the quality of endurance. We need people that can hang on. We need people that won't bail out when things get tough. We need people that can make it when life is continually becoming more and more difficult. But a lot of people, because I think James is implying this here, when he says, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends, well, what what is true? The opposite can be true. You can totally say it's an intruder, and you can hit the eject button and, and refuse to be in the middle of that process. So mindset matters when facing tough times. And here's what I think is true sometimes. Problems are very visible. When we're facing a difficult issue, the problem is right in front of us. It's up in our face. But the purpose behind what's going to come out of that problem is not as visible. It takes faith to see it. But what does the Bible say? The just shall live by faith. See, if you're not having to, to, to believe something that is not right in front of you and visible, then you've you, you know, you got to figure out how to do that. So how do, we, how do we have a mindset that allows it? About seven years ago, my, kez, my cousin Kelly, uh, whom I've only gotten to be around a handful of times because her dad was a full bird colonel in the military. He was a lieutenant colonel. Uh, I, I may have the rank wrong, but we've always called him full bird colonel. But Uncle Carl, he was the commander of an Air Force base in Anchorage, Alaska. Then he was the commander of Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, in Washington, D.C., so he was the first person to greet Ronald Reagan when he would step off the plane. So Kelly's life was a little bit different than me growing up in Wills Point. Uh, she lived in Spain. She lived in Alaska. She lived in, around Washington, D.C. She loved all of her. About, so I haven't gotten to be around them a lot, but I've been watching this unfold over the Internet, and I've met her son, Cole, but about seven years ago, her son was a high school student, and he dove into a river and hit his head on a rock, and since then he's been confined to a wheelchair. He's a quadriplegic. And a few months ago, I was following this on Facebook and reconnected with Kelly a little bit. And I started watching Cole's videos. It's called Roll with Cole. And and now it's Roll with Cole and Charisma because his girlfriend got added to the equation. And Cole has faced, if you can imagine, as as a teenager, face the reality that you're going to spend your life in a wheelchair. So I want to say this to you, I want to show this to you because I want you to hear what he says. It's just a little 50-second clip, but I want you to see what he says, and I want you to do this. If you know somebody who's gone through a spinal injury and who's facing that and, and fighting it, you need to let them know about Cole and Charisma's website. So watch this little video. I want you to see what Cole has to say about this struggle in his life. Now you're saying hello. 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 hello.
We just made it to the Shepherd Center. Where? To the Shepherd Center for In rehabilitation. What state? In Maybe. Atlanta, Georgia. This is our last stop on our RV trip. I'm really glad that we were able to fit it in too because I love this place. This is where I rehabbed over seven years ago and a couple times since then. And uh, it's really cool to be back. We're gonna see some of my old therapists, some of the people that helped me learn how to live again after my spinal cord injury. Falling in love with you. This is where I, somebody helped me learn how to live again after my spinal cord injury. In other words, this is where somebody helped me find purpose in my pain. This is where somebody showed me how to have a different mindset. When I was in uh, eighth grade, I don't know what it is about eighth grade this week, but when I was in eighth grade, uh, I uh, was playing basketball, and I liked basketball, and I was the kind of kid that was always going to hustle, but one of my problems was I had trouble guarding guys that were quick. I was one of the slower-footed guys. So my coach, being smart, realized I was probably going to keep playing through high school. Uh, every day in practice, he made me guard the quickest guy on the court. One of those guys is a friend of mine on Facebook. His name's Roderick Autry. Roderick's a little bit quick. He ran a 4.340 on grass in high school and won second place in 3A in the 200 meter two years in a row. And so every day I had to guard Roderick. Now that was really fun when they brought the varsity girls basketball team down to scrimmage the eighth grade guys. And then I had to guard the quickest girl on the varsity team. I had two problems with that. One was she was really cute, and it was just really awkward in eighth grade to have to guard this really pretty girl. And secondly, she just blew by me all day long. But can you guess what the result of that was? By the time I got to high school, I could guard the quicker guys. See, one of our problems is, is when we're, we're forced into a situation where we're having to do things that, that aren't comfortable, that, that require endurance, that that aren't what we want to be, then we struggle with, why am I having to go through this? But God knows what the... Have you ever considered that God might be coaching you? Have you ever considered that the thing that you're going through today really doesn't have hardly anything to do with today? But that what you're going through today has something to do with what you're going to face in 10 years? And God's smart enough to, to, to line all that out. So our problems often speak to our purpose and God puts us in those places. So I want you to know this, God values endurance. And endurance grows when we can visualize the finish line. Uh, that passage in James ends by saying this, is that the person who does what he just described, endures all those things, in the end he will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him after they've gone through the testing and the temptation and the endurance. So, the reason we're having problems sometimes pushing through certain struggles is because our vision of what victory will look like on the other side is too small. Your personal promised land has to be for you an ever-growing image in your heart and in your mind so that the payoff will be big enough to compel you to get through the battles that you're facing in the here and now. So, the end of eighth grade track season, I think I mentioned last week that my good friend, Stacy Stanberry was an incredible um, middle school athlete, and he won all six track meets. He got first place. Every, nobody ever beat him uh, running the 800. I chased him in practice, and because of that, I got a little bit better at it. And in eighth grade, we were on the track at Van High School over in East Texas, and I ran across the finish line, and there was Coach Armstrong with his clipboard and his coach's hat, being a coach. And he came over and he put his arm around me and he said, son, you did a good job of hanging in there and getting your team some points. And I looked up and said, coach, I just want you to know that's the last time I'll ever get on a track. Because in high school, I'm playing baseball. I'm not running any more track. Listen, there's somebody waiting for you at the finish line. I want the worship team to come and they're going to sing a song. And then at the end, we're going to have some of our, our children uh, share with us our annual Yo Mama event. So you can look forward to that. So I want you to just remember that 
you have to kind of keep in mind that there's some purpose to it. And God's not always good about explaining what that purpose is. In fact, he's under no obligation to explain it to you. What he is under obligation is to be faithful to you and walk with you and, and sustain you through it. But those people that we bump into that have that substance about them, I got a feeling those are the people that learned how some way not to resent the difficulties of life, but how to walk with them and through them and not be bitter about them. And then when they get to the other side of that difficulty, part of what happens is next time something small comes at you, you just think that's nothing. Because I've already been down this particular path. 